I'm Matt Yakman. I work for Arcona. Um, we're a consulting company that does support and consulting services. Um, worked for MySQL before, for Arcona and Sun as well, um, as a consultant. So, kind of gotten uh, a lot of work with a lot of different types of clients, Fortune 500, um, web based clients, and whatnot. Um, what I want to talk about is a data monitoring project uh, that's sponsored by the government that uh, we're involved with to monitor solar power usage and uh, energy usage across the United States. Um, right now, um, our goal is to start collecting data from various uh, solar power or uh, wind power installations across the U.S. Um, and we might potentially go uh, broader than that and go into like, Canada and Mexico eventually, but uh, right now it's just focused on the U.S. and uh, start gathering the data to start mining that uh, for various um, analytics purposes. So, um, one of the things that uh, we have to deal with is we've got uh, several thousand, uh, upwards of 10,000 inverters, so solar power inverters that uh, basically convert direct current energy to AC current energy uh, scattered across the U.S. Okay? Um, and these send in data feeds at various intervals. Some of them are at 15 minute increments, and those 15 minute increments have like minute by minute data. Some of them are second by second, and they come in in batches. So it's actually, you know, it's, it's staged, sent in at, at certain intervals. Uh, the data needs to be available for multiple years, so it's a, you know, it's a fairly large installation and a fairly large, fairly large application. So uh, this isn't a typical you know, application that most people consider with MySQL. Um, this is actually something that's uh, much larger. It's really kind of a hybrid of applications because it's not really just a, you know, a CRUD type of an application or an LTP application. It's not really a data warehousing application. It's kind of this hybrid approach. And um, the company that we're working with is uh, heavily rail shop, so they want to continue to use rails, which presents challenges in and of itself. So I don't know, does anybody here use Ruby, Ruby Rails? Oh, this will be relevant. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we ran into with the uh, design aspects from the development as well. All right, so uh, for the, the tech stack, they decided to go completely open source with the tech stack. Um, so we're using you know, kind of a combination of different technologies um, talk a little bit about how all these play. Uh, this isn't just a MySQL like centric thing. We're also going to talk a little bit about you know, how all of these different technologies interact. So uh, just wanted to throw those out there. All right. So the, the first thing, obviously, is you know we hit this bottleneck. We've got these ten thousand inverters that are all trying to come into the system at once. So we needed to design something that was really flexible and that allowed all the inverters to just you know come in at the same time and be processed in a very efficient, timely manner. Um, so, you know, it has to be fast, it has to do the 10,000 inverters. Uh, we can't wait for I.O. if we can avoid it. Um, and we determined that some data loss is acceptable, so if a few of these messages drop in the grand scheme of the analytics, it's not going to make a huge difference either way. But we still want to make sure that it's fast and it isn't blocking. So what we've decided to do is we actually decided to uh, right directly to um, a data queue, uh, an active MQ instance actually. So our inverters report from around the country at predetermined intervals. They go into a gateway, uh, then there's a data router. The data router routes the messages to the appropriate environment, um, and then it ends up in active MQ. Now our active MQ installation is actually persistent. We wanted it all memory uh, because we determined hey, if we lose the data, it's okay. So we don't have to wait for any IO or IDT or anything with, with the queuing mechanism. <coughs> so with the router, I wanted to point this out because this is one of the things that most people miss, especially in large deployments, is the ability to get good test data into their development instances. All right, this is one way to solve that problem. Uh, what we ran into with this particular client was uh, when we took a database dump, we are only getting part of the data that they needed. They really needed to test the data flow from their inverter all the way down to their uh, database stack and then to their front end application. So we wanted to give them something that would make fle be flexible enough to send messages that were received through the field 
into their development environment and go through all the various steps. So we actually created a small Sinatra app that uh, does data routing. And so that data routing looks up based on where it's coming from and the MAC address and determines where to route that message. So we might actually duplicate messages. We might say, hey, let's send this message to both production and development, or we might just send it to production. Um, that way, if we have kind of a flaky inverter and we need to work on like some hardware issues with the product that they actually sell, we can route those messages to an appropriate environment so we can do that. Um, but the thing is, that needs to be very lightweight and fast. So we actually don't do much with, in the router. We just basically look at a couple pieces of information and make the decision on which queue to send that to. All right. So, um, you know, this is where it gets into testing. And uh, I mentioned this just a second ago, that with, with testing, um, you know, this is, when you have a really complex system, you don't want to overlook the testing of the, the system. So, um, you know, you can have uh, potentially one part of your staff that looks and works perfectly fine, but when you test it as a whole, then you start to run into little problems. So, um, anytime that you can test end to end, you're going to get a better overall product in the end. All right, so um, what we've realized though is as these messages were coming in, the raw data actually has a lot of value to this client. So these messages come in as XML posts, and the XML posts contain you know, various information about like fault information, um, you know, where the data was routed from, uh, you know, weather conditions, a uh, multitude of things. So they really wanted a way for their engineers to look at the raw XML as well as look at you know, the, you know, the analog or the first out XML data. So, um, one of the things that we really needed to focus again on here is getting this data in quickly. So, you know, not only do we need the raw data, but we need to get it in quickly. So, we decided to uh, use a processor to stuff the data directly into uh, what we're calling a log database. Okay? And log database, it could be some sort of logging mechanism. There's, there's a lot of different ways to do this. But uh, in our case, the log database is just a really, really dumbed down database that has a few header elements and then the raw XML message. And this particular log database has uh, the potential to store data for ages. Okay, and with the log database, the real purpose of it is just to take the message off the queue. Oh. I'm sorry, you, I came in a little late, but um, perhaps you've already answered this. Um, how big is the data packet? Um, it's uh, anywhere from 50k to um, it could be uh, 250k. So it's quite big. It gets quite big. Yeah. 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 It's a very large. Yeah. Uh, so when we take the, the processor, we've, we've got that in memory in the queue. The processor basically just looks for some really you know, high-level details. Serial number, um, you know, where it's coming from, um, the firmware version, and uses those as a header into this log database. Right now, so it actually parses the XML. And Very good. It actually does a, a regex for certain elements that are there. Okay. Um, we're not, we don't want to fully parse the XML at this point. Okay, okay. Um, what we want to do is we want to take the queue, which is all in memory, so it's very fast getting there, and now we want to stick it somewhere where we know we can process it later on and do the heavy processing way. Okay. okay. So in, in this case, the log database is, um, I think I have this on the next slide, the log database. Um, Benchmarking of steps that are later on in the stack. 
All right, so um, this, is, this is key, and I wanted to mention this, and this is another thing that's often overlooked in really complex applications, is the ability to instrument and log your information you know, for the system at every critical step of the phase. A lot of people overlook this, especially in web shops where you know, you're throwing a web application a week. You sometimes don't put in the step to properly log uh, all the information. Now, some, some shops I've seen will actually log every call of the system or you know, they'll log you know, every page load. You know, those, those can be very valuable, but sometimes they can be time consuming. So there's a balance. You have to you know, choose, do you want really a lot of verbose logging or just some? Um, and some shops actually you know, have some sort of um, you know, parameter that they can flip on and off that says, you know, let's go and do Uber logging and log all the you know, data uh, calls. Maybe you're going to go into this, but it seems like you have a lot of data to capture. Yes. So what are your plans for like, history of you know, how many years? Well, we're, I didn't go into that. So, so um, if you give me a, a few slides, I can give you a little more. Just real quick. Um, uh -huh. How many years have you absorbed? Um, let's see. It's it's only a couple right now because we don't have all the burgers online. So it's, it's, it's a relatively you know, small footprint because we're still in the process of building this out. Um, but we're talking 10,000 burgers times, um, when we turn it fully on, 10,000 burgers times, you know, uh, a post every 15 minutes, two hours a day. Yeah. 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 So, so it's going to add up. It's, it's really big. Yeah. Um, These are windmills? Um, they're, they're solar power arrays and windmills, so it's, it's alternative energy. So they, they sell the burgers. Uh, that actually convert the direct current energy from, you know, um, solar power and windmill generated power to AC current that can be used in your house. So how many um, kilowatts are as a single inverter handling? Um, well, they have uh, various models, 100K, 30K, uh, up to, they're building the 500K models, so it varies. And so each one of those, they, they could have dozens of those uh, inverters in a single installation, but each inverter is rated for a certain uh, size. Okay, so is this an experiment? No, no, they, they, this, yeah. is their, this is their product line, so this is an experiment. They're already selling these, are, they've already deployed, so what they want to do now is they're actually being uh, uh, funded by the government to help build a monitoring solution to monitor the usage of the data across the United States. So you know, they want to, you know, basically the government wants to know and the company wants to know, hey, you know, how much carbon are we also having? How much power are we generated from solar versus, you know, regular? Uh, they also want to know some things on uh, how to make the grid smarter. For instance, um, oh, you know, this place in California, it's more sun than this other place. So if we place solar arrays here, it's going to be more efficient than if we place them, you know, 30 miles from the west. So that's kind of the goal of the whole project. I was curious how you're storing that symbol. Did you set the bottle? Yeah, uh, XML and MySQL. <laughs> um, we're, we're actually storing it in MySQL right now. Um, and it's, it's stored in a um, uh, text object, uh, or, or a medium text object, actually. Um, and we, we do compress it on the way in. Uh, well, actually, we don't compress it initially. We leave it raw for a certain amount of time, and we go back and compress it after a certain amount. Um, so we, when we started looking at where to put this data, there was actually a lot of options for us, right? So, you know, we, we talked about, you know, oh, we could still keep this in flat files. It would be kind of a mess, but we could. Um, we could look at, you know, SQL solutions, and we did. Um, and in the end, we decided that my ISAM was, you know, going to be the starting point for the initial data, um, eventually moving into archive and looking at compressing the XML. Um, but, uh, the, my ISAM allowed us to actually use some of the XPath queries that are available in MySQL to extract some of the data elements if we needed to. So we actually have a process that will go after a year and then start archiving this data off from the log database into basically shards. <clears throat> so you know you have a year's worth of data, and then the next year we'll move off to you know another log database structure that has everything compressed and shrunk down as much as possible. But the idea is they want these logs available for an indefinite amount of time. I don't know about anybody else, but every client that I work with, nobody wants to get rid of their data. I mean, it's a, a common problem, right? I mean, who, who, who wants to get rid of the data? But uh, 
As we all know, querying an expat can be bad, just like querying this at the beach. This could be really bad as well, right? So, um, we, in, in order to try, you know, keep things simple, um, you know, we wanted to. Um, actually, those slides are out of order. Um, in order to keep things simple, we left this in MySQL. So, um, you know, we thought keeping this in MySQL um, is going to be the simplest solution for us. We don't introduce another, you know, layer of complexity. Whether we decided to go with, let's say, a Mongo or a Cassandra or, you know, something else that was a NoSQL solution, you know, CouchDB, whatever, um, we figured that it was going to add a new tech layer that would cause us to start looking at, you know, um, additional things that we didn't have time to look at. So we wanted to keep with something simple. So you're not storing in XML files, you're storing in MySQL. Yeah, it's an XML field within MySQL. It's a block. It's a medium text. Okay. Field that's tagged? It's, yes. It's, a, it's just a medium text. It's inserted in. So how, how large are your tags? Are you using like one character for the no, no, they're, they're very verbose, and that's actually a problem because uh, that has a lot of space. Yes. Yep. Yeah, we, we prefer, and we're trying to get the firmware engineers to actually switch to something a little cleaner, like a JSON or you know um, something like that. That's going to minimize the amount of tag overhead. You can you can embed a JSON field. Well, it's just a text field, right? So whatever you send in, oh, these are just raw messages. Yeah. So whatever message came in from the inverter, we end up stuffing into the system. So this is an intermediate data store, high speed, programs in, yep. it out. Yep. So what happens, how do you stop performance from cratering and having something that's next time query on the next time? Um, well, we were very controlling about that. In fact, the next batch query only can occur on the slate. We actually have a slate to this. So we, we say, okay, if we're going to do that, realistically, it's only a small select subset of people who can actually do those expat queries. Okay? And it's very rare for us to do that. But when Very you want to do it, you want to do it. Right. It's, it's something like, you know, oh, there's, there's a problem. Plus, what we have is we have those header fields, so we actually really limit the amount of data. For instance, if somebody says, oh, we have this problem with inverter one, two, three in the field, okay? Um, we have a field in that table that is inverter one, two, three, because we uh, regexed for that, and we stuck it in a regular, you know, column. Okay. And, it's, and it's indexed. Yeah. So we can say, only give me the results for one, two, three, and then there's also a timestamp. So we can say between this time and this time, then X path. Right. Then it's very efficient because we're only searching through a very small subset of data. Right. So you do a bit of sort of na naive relationalization on the way in. Very, yeah, just a little bit to, to make it easier. All right, so let's see. Um, so what we decided then was we actually do need to get this into a relational format to actually then take that and let them query it and have this front-end application that they want. So we decided on you know, a simple you know, Ruby you know, script and a couple shell scripts to do this process. Um, it's actually a fairly heavy process because there's a lot of transformation, um, but you know, we, we decided this would be the easiest way to go. So we, we go from you know, the uh, production development uh, uh, route of the queue, to the process of log DG, this batch process that runs nightly, or actually every five minutes, uh, to process the data that comes in. Now we looked at ETL tools, but again, this gets down to the complexity of things. You know, when we talked about like the NoSQL options and things that we eliminated completely, we said, well, wait a minute. You know, if we're eliminating some of these other options because they're adding all this complexity, adding a new ETL tool um, was probably going to add that as well. Third-party ETL. Tool. These, you know, you've got these ETL tools, and they're great tools like you know Pentaho or Jaspersoft's ETL. It's just that you know they're they're a different stack. They require a learning curve, so we wanted to eliminate that. Uh, and since we've already had everything written in Ruby, and there's a lot of Ruby skills, we decided to stick with Ruby for now. Uh, sorry. Uh, so you're using the, the the active. They're just using straight active uh, record type. No, not for this. This is not Rails. So it's not it's not anything active record. Right, right now, it's just Ruby calling raw MySQL type of calls for the ETL. Yeah. Now, we do have lots of Rails, and we're going to get into that. But for this, Rails is completely inappropriate. Okay. In fact, a lot of this could be written in store procedures or in you know, like shells and all things. Or, or Perl or whatever. You know, it, it just happens that their stack is Ruby, so they're much more comfortable with Ruby than any of the other 
So we ended up putting it in Ruby to make sure that it simplified the entire environment for them. So after when we leave, you know, and they're off trying to support this, it's a stack they know instead of having a stack that, you know, oh look, here's here's this Perl thing. I don't know Perl, but I know Ruby. Or, you know, oh, here's this, you know, thing that's written in Bash and they're not really good at Bash. So what, when did you start doing this? Um, this was started about a year and a half ago. So per year, you must know how many uh, records you're collecting. Um, they roughly, I mean, a lot of this stuff is still coming online because um, a lot of the inverters uh -huh. are, are either not reporting yet or we've, you know, pushed them back. So I, th I think right now there's, Thousand inverters um, that, that we've got coming into the system. Not ten thousand. Not good. No, when we have ten thousand out in the field, it's just they're not all turned on. Because we're trying to still build a lot of this uh, uh, later on infrastructure that we get into. So how many records do you have to go through? Eleven million? Do you have your data set? Um, don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to calculate it out. Um, and I'd have to look at it. So this is eerily similar. To oh, the okay. system that I'm going to talk about shortly. <laughs> and so I'm going to, since we've had it online for a while and we've been through this, yes. I'm sure you're going to talk about this soon. But what, um, so you've done your ETL. Yes. Um, how are you going to manage the data volume when it grows? Because if this guy becomes successful, he won't stop at 10k inverters. Right. And um, th there's, there's some tricks and stuff that I'm going to go through in a few minutes on that. So hopefully that will help clear some of that. So uh, now, they, they actually have, like I said, they, they've got quite a few inverters, and um, they have a legacy system that has this data in it, and that legacy system that is still accepting data. Um, there's actually a very small footprint of data that they're collecting. Um, let's say 10% of the data that's actually coming in, but they want to collect more like 75% of it. And that's where the problem comes in, because with just the 10 like percent of the data that's coming in, uh, their database is already 400 gigs, 500 gigs, um, just for that. So yeah, and these these um, systems where you have essentially automated sensors, they grow like crazy, they grow like bees. Yes. Yep. You've got yep. A fair part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let me talk a little bit about you know when we did the ETL process. Uh, one of the things that we had to resolve to do uh, is since this the front end for this is actually a reporting engine. Okay, it's really you know built for reporting data you know uh, going out. We actually had to duplicate some of the data, and we actually had some issues because they're using a lot of bit mass fields, um, and bit mass fields are kind of a pain in the rear. And uh, with bit mass fields, uh, you know, there's a couple different things that you can actually do with them. You know, MySQL does have the set uh, data type, which is kind of cool for bit mass fields, but it's a really bare to use um, if you're going to actually modify your data frequently because you actually have to alter the table in order to use the set to add additional fields. If you have a set, they set works really well. We don't. Um, engineers tend to add things and don't tell us. So we we ended up having to do more of um, you know lookup tables and then have like an intermediate cross-reference table between those that says, okay, here's fault, you know, these four faults were tripped, here's what the fault name is. It just makes it really a mess for reporting, so we actually have to clean that up in data arts and in the data warehouse later on. I guess you really hope that nobody's going to scan through the report code, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Because we have exactly the same problem. Yeah. Um, because uh, MySQL doesn't actually, it, MySQL doesn't have like, the ability to fit that, or index anything but like a set column. So if you have a big int, let's say, and then you index that, when you do the bit minus wise math, MySQL doesn't actually um, translate that. It doesn't use the index to translate it. You're saying, hey, let's look for this. Yeah, it does any, 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 any function that you use break? Any yeah, it's a, it's a, the, function, the function will break the, the use of the index. Yeah, there is no function based index in MySQL. What about, uh, so instead of doing a, um, a single column with bit mass, why not do a, a compound column for for this. Uh, you mean like just have multiple columns? Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're doing a bit of a mask, you're going to want to break it into like 
you can, it's an indefinite one. You don't know how many of them. That's oh. the problem, is, right? So, you know, I've got 30, let's say, you know, um, different faults. And I want to say the fault 1, 2, 3, 4 through 30. And then the engineers add 31 and 32. And, and then they add, the, it, when these tables get huge, it's a real big pain. Okay. So what we're actually going to do is we're, the ETL process is actually fairly simple. And uh, instead of that, with, with the volume of data coming in, um, in our benchmarks, what we found is uh, it, it's going to slowly get behind when we start adding things. So we have to look at alternative ways to do the ETL process. Um, the old process is really you know, single thread. So uh, we decided to actually set up, and this is what we're in the process of writing right now, so this is actually in development still, is we're going to use uh, EarMath to actually schedule, uh, as the records come in, push workers or, or these records down to GearMan workers. And the GearMan worker itself will do the detail process. It'll do the transformation of the parsing. So we can have uh, n number of GearMan workers processing that data and pushing the data through uh, to the um, operational database. So that comes to the question for a couple of thoughts, is what do you do with all this data? You know, and um, but for a lot of people, you know, you have to ask yourself, how much data do you actually need? Okay, and so there's different, you know, like requirements for different companies. Some companies legally they have to keep data for 10 years. Okay, other companies they just want to keep data for 10 years. Um, and so you know, this is a hard question, especially for business people to understand because for them, disk is cheap. So let's just you know keep it on disk. Why, why do we why do we have to make that decision? Okay. But um, it's important to understand not only how much data you need generally, but look at each individual piece of data that you're collecting and understand what do you need you know, in terms of granularity, what do you need in terms of um, the lifespan of each thing, and you know, is there some sort of data subsets that you can extract out that aren't required at the same you know, level. So you know, obviously, you know, with the number of inverters that we have, this is going to get you know, monstrously huge. So what we actually have set up is we actually have uh, an operational database and a historical database. Okay? Now what we found with the historical database and the data that is needed long term is it's at a much different granularity and there's a much reduced subset of the data. Okay? So um, we found out that uh, with our historical database, um, for instance, we only needed 20% of the data long term. So we can, you know, even though you know in the immediate, you know, near term, we still need that 75% of their entire data stream. Long term, they only really need 20% or so. Plus, they said, okay, well, minute by minute data over the course of 10 years isn't really relevant. So you know, some of this data we can do at a you know monthly or at a daily basis, and some of it we can do at an hourly basis, and some of it we can do at, you know, an every 15 minute basis. So we're able to reduce the data set substantially just by doing that. And so um, what we have here is, for our particular uh, historical database, is we, you know, flow into the ops database, and from the ops database we replicate to another database, which is just a copy of ops, but we actually black hole the tables here, okay, in the, the replica. Um, and black hole basically means that the data comes in and it goes to dead null. Okay? But we have a trigger on there on insert, and on insert that trigger fires and can collect that data and then just process the data, the smaller subset, and move it over into the finalized you know, location. So you're going to trigger on the field string Yes. Yeah. So trigger and then you know the subset of data, we insert it, and then we have the smaller subset that we can aggregate it later on. Do you have any performance problems? We don't use triggering right now, but my understanding is triggering has quite a bit of Well, it's not as bad as you think with like inserts in this case, because uh, the data over here is relatively small and this is you know heavily partitioned. Oh, that is this is a I guess the replicated slate is not actually doing that much work, right? It's no, there, there isn't any contention there. Right. So you know it's it should be fairly straightforward. And uh, part of the problem with replication though, in this case, and this is one of the worries that we have, and we have to um, really benchmark this. Um, this is another thing that's uh, in flight right now. With, it's working perfectly fine with what we have, but we need to scale this up. 
and uh, we think it's going to work. But replication in and of itself is single threaded. So um, that could potentially be a problem. So we have another uh, thing we can do in the back burner is we can actually ETL this process every night as well. So we can pull off the results set from production and do the same thing. Do you have any idea what the shape of the performance curve is for replication when you get up into the gigawatt stage? Um, it, it's not, not, not bad. I mean, we, I've got clients who, you know, cut 50 gigs of binary log a day, and uh, it keeps up. And it doesn't cook the master? Uh, no, no, it doesn't cook. Really. I mean, you're, you're, there's some overhead of the master, but, um, you know, and it, it varies. But on the slate, a lot's dependent on the types of uh, operations you're doing. For instance, if you're altering tables and they take 24 hours, one state <laughs> is going to take 24 hours on the slate. Uh, and it's going to black everything for 24 hours. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, you know we're we're going to go down for our operating thing. It's going to our operational database is going to be 90 days. Um, the historical database is going to be longer term, and we're going to um, have it at a different granularity. So, uh, huh? so you're writing the gigabytes a day into a uh, into a binary log. Uh, okay. So uh, I know that if you're going to cross the Scope of the term of day, you're probably not going to fall behind too far, but at some point that binary log gets pretty enormous. Uh, do you sum your database, delete the binary log, take a snapshot, bring it back up again? How, how do you manage that? Well, I mean, uh, so typically, you know, binary logs are cut every, let's say, gig or whatever it's in. You can specify how big each binary log gets. Um, you can also specify how long you retain them. So, you know, in, in those types of situations, what we would recommend is. Let's say you have a two-day retention for binary logs, okay, and you know they're one gig each, so 50 gigs. That's 100 gigs. So you need 100 gigs in this case. Oh, that's set inside MySQL. You need to yes. tweak the size and the length and the chunks of the binary log. Yes. When sorry, deviating off a little <laughs> bit, but the uh, so when you do that, one of the big problems that I have with using a binary log or restart replication is you never know where you are. Uh, so, yeah. like, you don't know the, what the... Well, the MySQL should, if you have this link set up, it should know what position you're at, mm -hmm. right? So... Well, if, if the replication breaks, and you need to either roll back to a certain point or whatever, and the binary lock, like, unless you know exactly what that counter was at at the time when you made the snap to the next chunk of the binary lock, you don't really know where you are. And you can you can actually go through and you can look at if you do a MySQL bin log, you can dump the binary log and you can look for like a date and a position within there if you you know wanted to try that. There's also you can also run it. I think there's um I think there's something else that might help, but I'll have to look into it. We can talk after if you want. Um, so the the benefits of this is um, obviously if you have all that data long term in a giant operational database, um, it's going to be huge and nasty, right? And so when you start querying that data to actually get your you know, metrics for the, the, the clients and the operational data, if you've got, let's say, a year's worth of data, that's huge, and it's going to slow things down. So by doing the historical database, we give them a 90-day window that's hopefully much tighter and cleaner, and you, know, you can actually query the data uh, much more efficiently. And we give them the historical data that's already rolled up at the level that they want to see. Um, so one of the things that obviously, you know, as you start developing any large term project, people start saying, oh, we need to correlate more data. So you've got, you know, this giant database that you're building here. And they start saying, well, we've got these other databases now we want to pull data into. And so we started actually, you know, um, building quite a few data marts. Like our first one was, you know, a, a fault portal data mart that actually collects fault information from various um, other systems and combines it with support information. Um, and, and that's just one of those, you know, kind of out growing things. And uh, what we ultimately want to do is we actually want to, you know, really, really compact the data into more of an OLAP type of a system because that's where they think that the real power is going to be um, in terms of analyzing. So, you know, um, you know, what geographies are offering the most optimal, you know, power generation or, you know, um, which models or installations are the most efficient. So, you know, they can look for trends in their business and say, like, oh, this model is causing issues, whereas if we go to this other model with this other firmware version, this is actually a much you know, better solution. 
So that's you know what we're working on as well. That's kind of coming soon. Um, now, from the overall perspective, this is what's going to drive you know like smarter grid integration. So what they really want to do with this for like you know um, you know like, like government plans and things is you know power plants. Um, most of these inverters um, are actually grid tied, so they produce power that goes back to the um, power plants. So you know the house or or you know company or you know um, building that these are on, they generate power for them, but then they also send data back. So what they want to do is they want to be able to say, oh, well, we know that this area of the country can supply this particular power plant with this much on a regular day. Um, they can start planning around how much coal they have to burn or how much fuel they have to burn in order to supply the plant. Yeah, what, what I find with similar stuff to this, we have an instinct that will have to help us too. But what I, I find is that I have a strong suspicion that OLAP, you can probably pretty much answer those questions with very simple queries. It, um, and it, when we initially, if you looked at this project, it was kind of funny. When we started this, this was primarily a data warehousing project. And as we started getting into this, we actually started building more of these one-offs that I mentioned, like these smaller data marks that we actually started just building regular you know, queries and things. I think where the OLAP is going to help us is more on the summarization of data. Um, just because the data set sizes can be so large. Well, the thing, the thing that's interesting to me right now is the potential for doing real formal statistical analysis on this data, rather than just essentially you can group guys. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if you have any sort of instinct on how we have this data as well. For, um... So, determining cor correlations like um, what parameter changes and then what it affects. And yeah. Uh, those are those are things that I, I know we've we've talked about, um, especially with like firmware revisions for, for this. You know, as they release new firmware and new models, they want to know what has been the failure rate, what has been you know, like especially for like QA and the reliability. Yeah, that's exactly the sort of thing we're thinking about, which is like um, given this number of changes in lines of source code, what's the um, how does that correlate with other? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's very, very similar to what we're doing, except we're looking at it at a little higher level. You know, we're, like I said, you know, for us, it's um, firmer releases, it's model, you know, revisions, um, it's different types of boards that are in the systems. Um, they actually have, like, you know, different types of power supplies and things. And so those types of um, uh, configuration options and changes, they want to know, does it cause more, you know, uh, an increase in reliability or decrease? That's the sort of thing. And, and so that's where I think that some of that is actually going to have to be done in, in something that's, I'm not sure yet. Like I said, we're still, we're still in this phase. Somebody mentioned the R language for statistical modeling. Um, yeah, obviously. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm really used to it, but it sounds interesting. But you're, you're still, I mean, so they're building an OLAP, so they're going to lose some of the specificity of the granularity of like what's going on. So you decide that you really care about a specific Variable factor, and now it's too late to create a new. Right. One of the things that you, you may want to look into, and this is from a completely unexperienced, I've never done this before, I'm in the process of trying it out, is trying to load your raw data that you're building, you know, transform it, flatten it up, load it into a, a column based storage engine. Uh, that way it's kind of like you can't like manipulate it as readily as uh, traditional, it's not as fast as the, but for doing sure. reads and, yeah. yeah, you can, you can, it, they have a metadata layer that does a lot of the, the aggregating that the, your OLAP would do, and so a lot of times you, any of those queries on statistics, like how many counts of this particular type, it's already done in that metadata layer, so it never even actually goes into the, the table. So, um, we only got about, we're actually out of time. I'll try to go through these really quick. Um, like I said, the front end is actually written in Rails. And um, for what we found was we have so many different data sources that we actually started building. Uh, we went down the road of actually starting with Active Record. And Active Record for us just didn't work because of the different data sources. Um, so we actually have SOA calls to all the databases. So we built small Sinatra apps that um, return XML. Um, and everything is uh, passed back by, uh, by JSON to uh, 
uh, Google group visualizations in the front end. So it's actually kind of an interesting interface. Um, now for the Ruby challenges, uh, yeah, really quick, I'll pull through these as well. Uh, you know, we found we were pushing Active Record to the limits. Uh, a lot of things, you know, for instance, Ruby likes to do select start and everything when it returns data sets, which um, can be very bad in many cases. So, um, you know, we had lots of bad joins and things. So what we did for like the, the select stars is we, we've uh, implemented a lot of views, um, a lot of, you know, summary tables. Um, also, we, we had a lot of unneeded uh, queries. Uh, Ruby or any sort of ORM language tends to have a lot of overhead. Uh, so we would have a page that uh, Active Record would just decide uh, to loop through like the lookup table and retrieve all the rows over and over again. So we'd have like 10,000 queries on the page. So we had to reload some of that data. Um, we had to miss some problems with uh, multi-database support is not native in um, Active Record, so you, you can fake it into it, um, but that caused some issues. There were some issues with uh, use being supported in some of the migrations and uh, other operations, so you know, that caused other issues. Uh, and so what we also found was when we were evaluating some of the NoSQL solutions is some of those things were fixed. Uh, in no, no SQL, uh, but that was because it was just implemented differently. It wasn't the, it actually, you know, was faster necessarily. It was because, well, now instead of doing 10,000 queries, the driver is smarter and able to select it once. <laughs> you basically would need to do URL processing, okay. uh, form processing, stuff like that, provide an interpreter that we got to our support. Yeah, yeah and, and that's what we've done uh, a lot. Um, Part of the problem is working with a group of developers who are our Rails guys. They want to do models and everything, and they want to conform to the Ruby conventions. So uh, it's okay to, you know, use find by SQL. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It's okay to, you know, look at third party plugins. So you don't have to use Active Record. Does Ruby, Rail, I'm not a Rails developer, do PHP, and there's a bajillion ORMs, yeah. and every time they, they, they get a little bit better. I mean, does Rails have it? Alternative to Active Record, they give you the power of OR. Um, they have data macro, but it hasn't been really updated that much recently. I think it's nice because all of these things run out of speed at a certain point. And you discover that you're adding a whole lot of syntactic sugar to do stuff that you might as well just do it. Well, it's, it's like Hibernate is one of the most popular ORMs out there, right? And they have a gazillion problems with some you know, complex schemas and things because they want to do things the you know, Hibernate way. You know, for, for instance, they'd like to use GUI IDs, you know, for everything. Well, that would just kill database performance when you have a 32 bit character field as your private yeah, yeah, key. Yeah. You know, it's just, ugh, it's horrible. So, you know, it's okay to avoid using that. Yeah, there's really nothing wrong with SQL. Looks right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but Active Record, you know, uh, it, it, you know, avoided complex reporting, you know, a custom schema. That, that was part of the big problem here is we were designing the schema for the data as opposed to designing the application first and then. The schema flowing in to, you know, out, of, out of the Rails app. Um, and, uh, you know, like Rails developers, you know, when you're dealing with them, a lot of times, you know, they, they have this mentality of, hey, you know, we love simplicity, you know, we don't want to think about the database. So that's why, you know, a lot of the NoSQL solutions have become very popular as well, because a lot of that is the complexity of the database is taken away. So now all of a sudden they don't have to think about in terms of schema or columns or, you know, data structures. It's just there. Fine as long as you're doing something very simple. But yes. You might yeah. be well, of your, your own guess. That, that's part of the problem, though, the complexity of writing real SQL. And it, it, it can't be difficult for people who are doing it. That's, if you have a really complicated problem, then you just have to kind of suck it up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that, that we're over our time limit. But if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. You know, I'll, I'll hear through tomorrow. So we can. We can Sit down and talk. You know, grab me at lunch. Grab me in between conference sessions. Grab me during a conference session.